Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on a Civil War Research Trail. You know, when you talk about Confederate generals, you often hear that the Eastern theater generals were just terrific and the Western theater generals, not so much. A lot of infighting and other challenges. Well, here's an exception. Brigadier General Lewis Henry Little he proved one of the most capable senior officers during the early part of the war for the Confederate States, and he's been largely forgotten and overlooked by history. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland, attended West Point, and graduated in the class of 1839. By the way, the same year photography was invented for you students of photography. During the Mexican War, where so many Civil War officers were first tested in combat, Little proved his medal and received a brevet or honorary rank to captain. He remained in the Army after the war and found himself stationed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When the Civil War began, he resigned his commission, perhaps not a surprise considering his Baltimore connections and Maryland's precarious position as a border state. Anyway, Little resigned, became colonel on the staff of Major General Sterling Price. Little approved his abilities as an officer at the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas on March 6th to 7th, 1862. During the first day's fight, he led his brigade forward on an attack which he took on his own initiative. How's that for aggression? And continued the advance right up to the Union artillery when he was finally forced back. He showed similar aggression during the second day's fight, although the battle ended in a Union victory. Little superior officer, General Price, Sterling Price, affectionately known as Old Pap to his troops, praised him, praised Little, he said that Little deserves the highest praise for unceasing watchfulness and the good management of his entire command, end quote. Little received a promotion to Brigadier General. Six months later at Iuka, the Battle of Iuka, that's where Little's story ends. He suffered instant death. The most detailed description I could find of that death wound appears in a book called The Medical Histories of Confederate Generals by Jack D. Welsh. The entry for Little states, quote, on the day of his death, September 19th, 1862, he went to take command of the left wing and was just behind the Confederate lines conferring with General Sterling Price. A mini ball struck him on the line of the scalp over the left eye passed through his head and stopped under the skin on the occiput. He died instantly. He was initially buried at Iuka, but his remains were later moved to Green Mount Cemetery, Baltimore, Maryland, end quote. Now, I want to give you a better sense of Little and the battle and the moments around his death. To get there, Here's a passage from the 1910 memoirs of a Confederate veteran named William Lawrence Truman, who served in Walsh's company, Missouri Late Artillery. That name Truman? Yeah, he's related to Harry S. Truman. William's uncle was the grandfather of Harry S. Truman. Now, here's what William L. Truman remembered about that day at Iuka. He says, quote, we shifted our position several times and late this evening had orders to double quick back to town as the enemy were about to enter town by another road and that it would take some very fast marching to beat them. As couriers continued to arrive with orders to hurry up and that our line of battle near the town had been met and driven back, our old grand 1st Missouri Brigade, upon which it seemed everything depended, was to keep up the double quick movement and that they were in a run at the times. It was hot and dusty and the boys suffered dreadfully under their burden. Their uniforms were made of heavy goods 
and they carried a heavy blanket, 40 rounds of ammunition, bayonet, canteen, and musket. Wade's battery kept close to the heels of the brigade. General Little, at the end of his invincible 1st Missouri Brigade, was in time. The victorious enemy were within a half mile of town. As General Little passed through and double quick and formed a line of battle on a run in the edge of the woods near town and without water or a moment's rest, they moved forward with that brave old 3rd Louisiana Regiment that had stood with the Missourians so many times in battle and was never known to flinch. Also, Whitfield's Texas Legion and a battalion of Arkansas troops, all on our left, moved forward in one line together, under the immediate eye of our dear old Pap. Recall, that's General Sterling Price. He was happy. The old guard was just in time, and he knew what would happen in a few minutes when his tired, hot, and thirsty veterans met the invaders under their able General Rosecrans. That's William S. Rosecrans. Truman continues, This grand old 1st Missouri Brigade that has never lost a fight were in the worst possible condition to meet the enemy. They were almost overcome with heat as they had been on a run for three miles or more and it was cruel to lead them against such a brave, victorious foe, fresh and well-supplied, without giving them water and 30 minutes rest. But they must go forward in this broken-down condition without a minute's rest, and they must win. The brave foe must be beaten and hurled back. Otherwise, old Pap's retreat will be cut off, as we see it and his command routed. The line continues to go forward. They now enter the timber that surrounds the little town. The sun is now disappearing behind the trees. All is quiet for a moment. Now, the skirmish lines are popping away. Now, the long, deadly volleys of musketry from 10,000 guns have turned loose. The earth trembles. The rebel yell goes up from all along our lines. The death grapple is on and the small arms continues to roar. Our battery is close up under fire, but we are in the woods and cannot get a position to help our men. Another yell is given, which tells us the enemy has given away and is falling back. They soon rally, and as our lines move forward, the fierce contest is renewed. This time, our gallant Louisiana, Texas, and handful of Arkansas men who were on our left, ran up against an Ohio battery, but they never halted until they got possession of the guns. After a bloody hand-to-hand -hand fight with dreadful loss, again, the enemy is forced back all along the line. It is now eight o'clock, and it is very dark in the woods. The fight is still raging. The mini balls fall in showers around our battery as we remain halted in the road behind our line of battle. We cannot get into position to help our infantry on account of the heavy timber. A volley frightened the team on our battery forge, and they wheeled around in the road and broke the tongue of the forge. The smith was until midnight putting another on as he had work as noiseless as possible to do to keep from drawing fire of the enemy. Our hearts are bowed in sorrow as we stand here under fire to hear that our gallant and honored leader, General Henry Little, is killed. This is a bloody, desperate fight at close quarters with bayonets at time. Many brave men have fallen. At 10 o'clock, the fighting is over, except along the skirmish line where a few shots still ring out. At 12 o'clock, we are ordered to fall back, and we find that old Pap is on a retreat. This is much regretted. So many of our brave men have given their lives in battle and to no purpose. Our dead and wounded are left in the hands of the enemy. The cries of our wounded for water and help are left to be supplied by the invading stranger's hands, far away from their homes and loved ones, who would love so much to be with them. We move back quietly without the loss of property, to Baldwin on the railroad. 
The enemy ran on to our rear guard once to test its mettle and was severely chastised and were satisfied to let us retire in peace. General Little's 1st Missouri Brigade and Wade Battery have seen about 20 months of hard service, drilling, marching, counter-marching, often all day and all night, through all kinds of weather, forming lines of battle several times, often in one day. Skirmishing, light and heavy, they had fought with success the Battle of Elkhorn and had always conducted themselves in such fine military order that their general, who had taken such pride in training them, was truly proud of them. He felt like he could depend upon them in any emergency. Old Pap had come to the same conclusion. Our success equally is due to the help of the Invincible 3rd Louisiana and Whitfield's Legion and Battalion of Arkansas Boys. In driving back the victorious enemy and saving Old Pap, when it seemed his star was about to go down. It was a feat that General Price and other officers that knew the situation of our army could never forget. General Little stayed with his men in their victorious charge and was instantly killed by a mini ball passing through his head while the shout of victory was ringing in his ears. We will miss him so much for he took such good care of his men, his body, was quietly laid to rest that night in a hastily prepared grave in Iuka. So there you have the story of a general, a Confederate general, Henry Little of Baltimore, Maryland, killed during the Battle of Iuka in September of 1862. One of the more capable, I dare say most capable, Confederate generals in the West, his name almost completely lost in history. One wonders what had happened, what could have happened had that mini ball whizzed past his head on the battlefield as he conferred with General Price and had lived to fight another battle. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.